to Long Shorts from the Long U.S. China Institute at UC Irvine. I'm Emily Baum, and today I'm here with Maggie Green, an assistant professor at Montana State University and author of the book Resisting Spirits, Drama Reform and Cultural Transformation in the People's Republic of China. Maggie, thanks so much for talking with me today. Well, thank you for having me on. So Maggie, in your book, you talk about a particular genre of Chinese opera called a ghost opera. Maybe to just get started, could you give us a quick understanding of what a ghost opera is? So uh, ghost opera is actually a pretty well-defined category, um, and it's one that is a really celebrated genre in Chinese theater. And a ghost opera, at least in the ways that the um, authors and cultural workers that um, I am writing about, as well as the ways in which a lot of other people would understand it, um, is pretty static, and it comprises a couple of things. The first is that it's always traditional Chinese opera, which is different than spoken language drama, hua jiu in Chinese, which is what we would think of as a regular play like Shakespeare or something. Um, and it's different than ge jiu or, or a Western style opera. And traditional Chinese opera is always composed of singing, postures, uh, dance, um, music, of course, also speaking, but it, it's a very sort of identifiable product in some respects. Um, more importantly for ghost opera, as the title might imply, uh, one of the key points for all the plots that are considered ghost operas is that one of the main characters is going to die and is going to come back in the form of a ghost. And sometimes these can be um, romances, sometimes they can be stories related to war, sometimes they can be romantic comedies, sometimes they can be romantic tragedies, but basically somebody coming back as a ghost is a key pot, plot point uh, in all of these. So all the products I look at um, can be subsumed under that, that category of, of ghost opera or guixi in Chinese. So that seems innocuous enough, but you describe in the book how in the 1950s and 1960s, ghost operas really became a target of attack by the Chinese Communist Party. So why was this the case? So ghost operas actually are a really problematic part of the canon, the literary canon for Chinese communists. Uh, on the one hand, they are in many cases incredibly celebrated. Um, some of the most famous works of Chinese literature are either ghost operas or also include other kinds of supernatural literature. And this is something that the Chinese Communist Party was very concerned about um, in terms of if we're just thinking about broadly among their goals for the people and the masses generally. Um, they want to stamp out superstition, they want to stamp out belief, and these things that they fear are backwards or not modern. Um, so this is kind of the tension that I'm exploring in the book, is this tension between, on the one hand, we have these really wonderful parts of the Chinese literary canon that are beloved, not just from elite intellectuals or elite cultural workers, but, you know, we're really popular among average everyday people and stories that we're familiar, but this concern that maybe watching these things meant that the Chinese people themselves were backwards or not modern enough. Um, and also sort of concerns just relating to the creation of new kinds of culture, which is something that uh, the, the CCP had been really concerned about for um, a very long time and regimes ahead of them had been as well. So your book is not just concerned about the state's regulation of these ghost operas, but I think more importantly, it's also concerned with the dramatists who were writing these operas. So how did these dramatists try to navigate all of these shifting state policies about cultural production? So this is actually really the heart of the book, is how cultural workers uh, really tried to balance a certain reverence for traditional Chinese culture, the very best parts that they saw of the Chinese literary canon. I mean, these things are often described in my sources as um, the people's inheritance. So we're not talking about minor things. Um, we're talking about really, really major things. But at the same time, we have these shifting regulations and they're trying desperately to balance 
this reverence, but also wanting to live up to these standards and many times really quite impossible standards. Uh, so what I really show in the book is how uh, creative and how experimental a lot of the dramatists and cultural workers were in trying to balance these two demands, this desire on the one hand to preserve Chinese culture, but on the flip side, live up to these newer socialist dictates on art and literature. And so, you know, there's extremes that I discuss in the book. And in some in one case, uh, there's a dramatist who writes a ghostless ghost play um, in an attempt to sort of fix the superstitious problems. But one of the major cases I study is kind of a study in how little do you have to do to a product that has 800 years of history to make it live up to socialist dictates on art and literature. So um, they really, really, really struggled. Uh, but I think that's actually one of the really interesting parts of the story is, is how cultural workers and artists um, tried to balance these and many times really conflicting demands. Now, given that ghost operas came under attack in the 1960s, and given that there are all of these debates and conversations about ghost operas, how do we account for the fact that by the 1980s, ghost operas had sort of come back into full force? So that's actually a really great question. I think there are sort of two answers. The first is that one of the major ghost plays I study was really key in launching the early cultural revolution in, in 1965 and 1966. Um, I think people in 1979 were really excited that the Cultural Revolution was over. And so bringing back some of these products that had been so heavily criticized between 1963 and 1966 and then continuing um, really sort of represented this trauma that people had experienced, you know, since the middle of the 1960s. That was over. Um, that was over now. And now we can be enjoying these things that we'd always enjoyed. The second thing is, these were things that people had always enjoyed and were really important parts of the Chinese literary and theatrical canon. Um, and people were excited to see them back on stages again, and they were allowed to be back on stages. So in some respects, it's a bit like a floodgate opening. I think people were really hungry for things that they hadn't been able to see for 10 years, in the case of Ghost Opera, even longer than that. So we often hear about the Chinese Communist Party censoring media content. So what kind of insights do you think your book can give us about the nature of cultural production in China today? So I actually end the epilogue of the book with an anecdote from when I was in Shanghai in 2011 researching my dissertation. And uh, in March of 2011, the State Administration of Radio, Film and Television I came out with a directive and the directive strongly discouraged, didn't actually formally ban, but strongly discouraged uh, a whole range of topics. And they, they said it was everything from, you know, superstitious topics to, to pornographic to this, that, and the other. And then they, they pulled out some specific examples and they used the example of things like time travel. Um, and it was amazing to me in 2011 that if you'd just taken out the references to television, you could have taken that directive and put it into 1963 um, very easily. It bore a shocking amount of similarity to the 1963 ban on ghost opera. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from the high socialist period and how the CCP was dealing with culture. Um, the party remains concerned, very concerned with what people are consuming and what types of products they're consuming um, and wants to continue to have a hand in that. Um, I think there's a lot more similarities between contemporary cultural regulation such on, th on things like video games um, and high socialist era regulation of things like ghost plays. I think um, we would do well, and I'm hoping um, other people will go forward with this sort of line of thinking. And even in my next project, I look forward to getting to delve into this a little bit. Um, but what, what are the similarities and what are the parallels between these 1950s and 60s regulations and what's going on today because I personally see um, a lot. Well Maggie, thank you again for talking with me. I thought your book was just beautifully written and I really enjoyed reading it. Well thank you so much and it was a delight to be here with you today.